and sisters, this is the day that the Lord has made. You have to choose to rejoice and be glad because we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have the word in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, which gives you the power to step over whatever it is that you're faced with and step into the truth of the word of God. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. God is good because he's God. That's his character. He's a God of love. He never changes. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. That's his promise. He and his word are one. So if the word will never pass away, God will never pass away. He is God all by himself. You can trust him. He is from everlasting to everlasting. God is all knowing. He's all powerful. He's all present. He's a God who never has to go anywhere because he's already there. He's a God that you never have to tell anything because he knows the end before we even know the beginning. You don't have to be strong in yourself because you serve the God who is all powerful. Sisters, as we walk this way of holiness with your designer suit on, strutting with your holy swag, understand that it is God who is leading you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. You never have to fear what is in that path because his grace is sustaining you. Sisters, 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 good morning this day. Special shout out to some of my sisters from my congregation, Newsom Street Church of Christ, who are on this morning. And I just thank you so much. Some of them were on last week, I think, but they've been able to join us. I think Val and Sister Pat have been getting the word out here in Valdosta and the sisters are coming on. And I thank you so, so much. So this morning, sisters, under our overarching theme of getting through what you're going through. This morning, we're gonna talk about fitness for life, spiritually, physically, and mentally. First Corinthians 3, 16 says, "'Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, "'that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you.'" First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, "'What know ye not that your body "'is the temple of the Holy Ghost, "'which is in you, which ye have of God, "'and ye are not your own? "'For ye are bought with a price, "'therefore glorify God in your body "'and in your spirit, which are God's.'" And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the topic for uh, this morning, fitness for life, spiritually, physically, and mentally. And it's one that is so apropos for this day. And, and we need to understand how to become fit. There's a lot of emphasis today on physical healthiness and there are gyms popping up all over and many people are going to the gym trying to get physically fit by working out. But have you ever considered that all three components of yourself, your whole self need to be worked out? Your spiritual self needs to, be, to become fit your physical self needs to become fit and your mental or emotional self needs to become fit. You, can, you can't exercise one and forget about the other two. All parts complete the whole. And under this topic, I'd like to propose three points and that'll help you to understand the completeness of ourself. We have to be fit spiritually, which is to hear. We have to be fit mentally or emotionally to process and physically to walk or to live. Well, how do you get fit? First of all, let's define the term fitness. The word fitness means being fit or suitable, morally fit, spiritually fit, emotionally fit, conformity with what is demanded by the circumstances, fitting together, being ready to do what is required. So our theme scripture, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you. Remember our other theme scripture, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So the, the book of 1 Corinthians was written by the apostle Paul. What events led Paul to ask this rhetorical question in chapter three? Well, let's back up and, and look at what he said previously so that we can understand why he felt it necessary to address this issue. The question that Paul asked, it didn't demand an answer. It's a rhetorical question, one that they already knew the answer to. The first letter to the church of Co at Corinth was written because there were problems in the church. Corinth was the most important city in Greece. Corinth was the capital of the Roman province. While Corinth was a commercial city, it nevertheless prided itself upon its culture and, and it abounded in studies and workshops and halls of rhetoric and schools of philosophy. However, the city was, was no, more, no more widely known for its wealth and culture than for its wickedness, for its moral corruption. It was the seat of a debased form of worship of Venus and, and of impure cults from Egypt and Asia. 
to live as a Corinthian meant to the, to the men of Paul's day, to live in luxury and licentiousness. And phrases, Corinthian banquet and Corinthian drinkers were similarly proverbial. If you said you live in like a Corinthian, that meant that you were living a pretty, uh, pretty dismal life, a pretty licentious life, doing what felt good. So this is the atmosphere that Paul came into. This was his second missionary journey. He came to Corinth and he was immediately weighed down by the sight of the godlessness and the impurity, the impurity and the vice and the depravity. So Paul, all alone in the city, began to preach the gospel. The Bible says in weakness and fear and trembling, but with the determination to be true to the message of Jesus and to the cross. So Paul formed a friendship with Aquila and Priscilla, who had come from Rome to set up their tent-making business in Corinth. So they welcomed Paul, and he found that they were receptive to his teaching, and they and they were saved. So shortly thereafter, his friends Timothy and Silas arrived in Corinth. So Paul began to preach with power. Many Greeks and Jews were saved, and, and the church was established in Corinth. So the great majority of believers were from the lower classes. Some were slaves, and some were freed slaves. Some were Jews, but most were Gentiles. They were so-called high-ranking folk and they're low-ranking folk, rich and poor, those who, those who had and those who had not, those who had been rescued from the lowest depths of depravity. The Corinthians were known as the people who did whatever felt good. To live like a Corinthian meant that you just did whatever fleshly desires you wanted to do. These were the folks who Paul preached to. These are the folks who obeyed the gospel. So the church was established and Paul remained there for another 18 months. He was preaching and enlarging the Christian community, helping them to mature in the word. He left Corinth for Jerusalem, left behind a strong and flourishing church. Well, during the next three years, Paul stayed in contact with the church. Letters were exchanged between Paul and the Corinthian converts. So because he stayed in touch with the church, Paul became aware of some distressing conditions that had developed at the Corinthian church. Not only did he get letters stating some problems, but a delegation of three distinguished members of the church made a trip to consult with Paul to inform him of what was going on in the church. So from all these sources, Paul had acquired a rather full and accurate knowledge of the situation in Corinth. The facts were disturbing. Paul was disturbed by what was going on. The church was torn by factions and, and disgracefully lax in administering discipline. The members were contending against one another in heathen law courts, and they were tolerant of gross immoralities in social life. They were desirous of instruction re relative to marriage, to the use of meats which had been offered to idols, and the proper use of spiritual gifts. They were disorderly in the observance of the Lord's Supper. Some were denying the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. So Paul wrote this letter of 1 Corinthians. So in chapter 1, Paul began to address the problems in the church. In chapter 1, uh, verses 10 through 17, Paul exhorted the church to unity. He reminded them of the unity of the body. And then in verse 18, 31, Paul reminded them that the gospel is a manifestation of the wisdom and power of God and not of man. So they couldn't take any credit. In chapter 2, Paul told the church that the gospel belongs to God and, he, and it's interpreted only by the spirit of God and not according to what men thought. So Paul went on in chapter three to tell them that having factions and divisions or having cliques shows spiritual immaturity and that Christians are servants of God. You don't put yourself over anyone else because we're all a part of the body of Christ. Paul said, when I was there, I fed you with milk because you were babes, but, but you're still on milk. You haven't grown. You should be eating meat. How do I know you haven't grown? Don't you know that as long as you allow divisions within the body, you're in a carnal state and you're still babes? Christ died for you. He revealed his word to you. It wasn't by human wisdom. And now I hear that there are divisions among you. You're glorying in yourself, Paul said. Did you die for yourself? Did Paul die for you? Did Apollos die for you? No, Christ died for us all. We're one in Christ. And that is what unites us. So Paul told them that they were in a carnal state and, and that was preventing spiritual fitness. We're in this thing together. We're not alone. He said in, in chapter three, verse nine, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And then we get to our theme scripture. Paul said, don't you know that because of Christ did, not because of what Paul or anyone else did, that you're at the temple of the God and the spirit of God dwells in you. Your temple is holy because the God within you is holy. You didn't do this thing by yourself. It was done by God. He saved us. He made us one in him. You don't have any room to glory in anyone but God. 
Paul told them that they were in a carnal state and that was preventing spiritual growth. So since we're labels together, there are no big eyes and there are no little U's. Don't you know that you're the temple of God, you're a holy temple and you should conduct yourself in that way. If not, you're not fit for spiritual life. You're not fit for physical life in the spirit and you're not mentally or emotionally fit. The body or the temple is precious and should be treated as such so that you'll be fit for the master's use. All parts have to come into line, your spirit, your soul, and your body. And so that's what I wanna to talk to you about this morning, sisters, fitness for life, spiritually, mentally, physically, being fit not only for this life, but for the life to come. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Paul continues with the same thing. What? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? Ye are not your own. When you're saved, sisters, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to God. You're bought with a price, and that price was the precious blood of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You can't glorify God in your body if your mind is not being renewed by the word. Your body does what your mind tells it to. If you want to be fit for this life and the life to come, you have to strengthen your vertical relationship, internalize the word of God, and line up with, line up with what you are learning. What is fitness? Well, it means being fit or suitable. It means uh, being spiritually, morally, and emotional suitable. It refers to the whole man. Is my microphone, go is my microphone going off? You're good, Doc. Okay, I just see some stuff there. Okay, yes, so yes. What, is, uh, what is fitness? It means to be spiritually, morally, and emotionally suitable. It refers to the whole man. First Thessalonians 5.23 says, And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it means being in conformity with what is demanded by the circumstances, fitting together spirit soul and body, one complete whole being ready to do what is required. Philippians 3.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You can do nothing in yourself. I can do all things, what? Through Christ. There's your vertical, through Christ. There's this. You gotta be in tune with this so that when that happens, you can get through it. How do you get what you're going through? By establishing this. So when that happens, you have something to hang on to. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So I know this was a fairly long overview, but I want you to understand just what Paul is talking about in our lesson so we can understand what it means to be fit for life spiritually physically, mentally. So very briefly, sisters, we're going to look at three points. One, spiritually fit to hear and render obedience. Two, mentally fit to process what has been heard. And three, physically fit to behave based on what has been processed. So our first point, spiritually fit to hear and render obedience. Now, before you can be fit spiritually, you got to be saved. This is the part that we can't do anything about. This is the Lord's work because it's by his grace that we're saved, that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We can't take any credit because we couldn't do anything but respond in obedience to the gospel and accept the gift that God was giving, his gift of salvation. When you're saved, your spirit is made alive. Your spirit was dead. Your spirit was dead in trespasses and sins. But Paul said in Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, but God, there's the, there is the, there is the, 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 the bridge, but you got to look at what happened before, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, a dead man can't do nothing. A dead man can't do nothing. If you're at a funeral and you holler fire, the only one that will not run out of that place is the one who's in that casket. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, for what he loved us, even when you were dead in sins, has quickened us together or made us alive with Christ. By grace, ye are saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
Sister Isha, your spirit was dead. You couldn't resurrect yourself. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that saved us and raised us from the deadness of sin. We can't be saved apart from the spirit of God. You cannot live this Christian life apart from the spirit of God. You were filled with the Holy Spirit of God when you went into that water and came up a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. You're, you are seated in him. You're not seated in heavenly places by yourself. We're there together. We're there together. We are in unity with Christ. We're added to the body and the body is one. And if you're part of the, of the one body, you're not by yourself. Listen to what Paul said in Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up together made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus you're not in it by yourself we're in this together I can't lord it over you you can't lord it over me there are no big eyes and no little use we're all one in Christ we didn't get saved because we had enough money or because we were so beautiful or, or because we had fame or education or possessions. Whether we are black or white, it doesn't matter. There is nothing that anyone can do to merit salvation. We can't be good enough to get saved or to stay saved. Salvation is of, by, and for God through his son, Jesus Christ. When you get saved and your spirit is made alive, this opens you up to begin to hear the word of God to begin to transform your mind and begin to agree with what the word says. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is Paul saying? He said, now that you're saved and your spirit has been made alive, now you can begin to work on the heart, the mental part, the mind. This is where it becomes an individual walk, an individual responsibility for strengthening your relationship with our Lord. Point number two, to process or to think emotionally, mentally fit, how to think. Paul said, don't be conformed to this world. In other words, don't keep doing stuff the way you used to do it. Your spirit has been made alive. It's been made fit. And now your mind or your heart has to catch up with your spirit. Your spirit has been made alive. And now you have to begin to transform. You have to begin to change your mind. Your mind has to be continually renewed by the word. When your mind doesn't agree with the word, you do an exchange. You exchange what you thought for what is right. What's in your mind is not the truth. God's word is truth. So you have to renew your mind to be in agreement with the truth that's being revealed in your spirit by the word of God. So whenever you read the word, whenever you hear the word and, and your thought processes disagree with what you have heard or read, then you got to change your mind. The word is not going to change. You've got to change your mind. Renew your mind to agree with the word. Your truth is not always the truth. You can believe something and think it's the truth, but when you're confronted with the truth of the word, then you have to understand that what you thought is not the truth. Be willing to give up your idea of truth for God's revealed truth. What you thought, sisters, what we thought was not truth. When you begin to read the word of God and actually see what truth is, you've got to change your mind. You've got to exchange it. You've got to renew your mind by the word of God. Be not be transformed by the renewing. It's the continual process. I-N-G on the verb means you keep doing it. Renewing your mind that you may approve of what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Paul is saying that you begin to approve of the will of God, which is his word. When you read the word and when you hear the preached word, you begin to agree with the word and you change your way of thinking. What you're saying is, I approve God, your word is right, and I'm changing my mind to agree with your word. What does the word say about your mind or your heart? Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence at your mind, for out of it spring the issues of life. Proverbs 14.30, a sound heart or mind is the life of the flesh. Proverbs 23.7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
You have to establish that vertical relationship with the Lord so you can begin to see just what God expects of you in his word. The strength of your vertical relationship dictates how you handle those horizontal issues as they arise. We don't always get it right, sisters. That's why God left first John 1 and 9 in the Bible. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But we got to make the effort. God knew we weren't going to get it right. That's why he left that verse there. So it's all about what's in your heart, what's in your mind. How do you process things? How do you see things? If you see things other than through the filtering system of the word of God, you'll begin to, you will continue to come to an in accurate conclusion. To be emotionally fit, sisters, you have to have a healthy mind or you always see things based on your unhealthy filtering system. Your mind is a filtering system. Your mind tells you how to feel and how to act. If you have negatives in your mind about yourself, how you feel. If your filtering system is negative, you'll filter out the good and retain the negatives. Your mind is the direction giver. Your mind dictates how you feel about things, your way of thinking, your way of feeling. What is in your mind will determine whether you respond to a situation or whether you react. If your mind is being renewed by the word of God, you begin to respond based on the word. If your mind is not being renewed by the word of God, you will react based on your emotions. You react based on how others are acting. And this is acting out of your emotions. What did Paul say about what to do with your emotions? Casting down imaginations or your emotions, your own negative thoughts, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. So the condition of your mind makes the difference in your fitness. Your unhealthy mind has to be continually renewed so that your thinking processes can be changed. You need to change the filter of your mind to get rid of the junk that your filter has retained. You have to begin to renew your mind, to transform your mind, to begin to think differently about yourself. Filter out the negatives and retain the positives of what the word of God says. Begin to agree with the word of God. Begin to agree with the spirit of God. And sisters, my final point, Physically, behaviorally fit, how to behave, how to live once your spirit has been made fit. Your mind is being made fit continually. So now we can begin to work on the body, becoming behaviorally fit, knowing how to live as a result of what you are learning. You're spiritually fit, you're understanding your vertical relationship with God, St. Mark 12 and 30 says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. There is your vertical. Then your neighbor as yourself. There's your horizontal. This first, then that. First John 1 and 7, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, there's your vertical. Then you'll have fellowship one with another. There's your horizontal. Strengthening your vertical relationship so that you can, you can handle issues on the horizontal level as they arise. Your horizontal issues, issues are handled based on the strength of your vertical. How do you behave according to your vertical relationship? How do you handle the word? If you try to handle horizontal issues without the strength of the vertical, then you'll always be handling issues emotionally because if the vertical is not in place, the horizontal has no support. Sisters, the vertical cannot stand without the support. The horizontal can't stand without the support of the vertical. The vertical is your relationship with God, internalizing the word of God. It'll strengthen you to deal with the horizontal issues as they arise. How can you, as James says in James 1 and 2, count it all joy when, not if, but when you fall into diverse temptations? How can you count it all joy? Dr. Dow, you muted again. Okay, where did I leave off? There you go. I'm not. I... Okay. Um, Count it all joy. Count it all joy is where okay. we were. How can you, as James uh, says in James 1 and, 2, 1 and 2, how can you count it all joy when you fall into those diverse temptations? How can you count it all joy? Because of your vertical relationship. Sisters, you understand that your faith and trust is in God and he knows everything that's happening or that will happen in your life. You can behave 
like you believe. You can believe that all things work together for good because you love God and you're called according to his purpose. You can believe that there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful in that he will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Sisters, your mind is being renewed by the word of God. Your body can only do what your mind tells it to do. So if you want your behavior to be right, your mind's got to be right. Your mind has to be continually renewed by the word of God. You can't think wrong and do right. Your mind calls the shots and your body follows those directions. So how do you become physically fit? By the continual renewing of your mind so that you can direct your body based on the word. So how do these all these three work together? Philippians 1 and 6 is being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus began the work. He'll be the one to complete the work. But what does he expect you to do? Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What is Paul saying to you? He's saying, work out what the Lord is working in. You're to work it out. You're to believe. You're to live what he's teaching. Your mind is being renewed by the words. You can be begin to live the word that is being worked in your mind. Paul said, don't do things the way you used to do them. Now that your spirit has been made alive, transform your mind by the truth of the word and begin to live it. Begin to live what you believe. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Again, now may the God of peace sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you with is faithful who will also do it. First Corinthians 3, 16, again, know ye not that your temple, you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of you. It's all got to work together. Your mind directs your body. Your body can't do anything of itself. Your mind gives direction to your body. Whatever your mind tells your body to do is what you're going to do. So how do you become fit spiritually, mentally, and physically? How do you make sure that you're fit for this life and for the life to come? You have to think right, your mind, you have to do right, your hands, and you have to walk right, your feet. I just want to show you briefly an Old Testament example. In 1 Kings 21 through 23, the prophet Elijah is talking about Jezebel. You, you all remember Jezebel. We don't have to go into the story about Jezebel, but we, we all remember Jezebel. And every thought was evil and she did only wickedness. So here's what Elijah prophesied. He said, as for Jezebel, also spake the Lord saying, the dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And then 2 Kings 9, 33 through 36. And he said, throw her down. This talking about Jezebel, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses and they trod her underfoot. And they went to bury Jezebel, but they found no more of her than her skull and her feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore, they came again and told him, and he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah, saying, in the portion of Jezreel shall, shall the dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. Sisters, the, jog, the dogs ate Jezebel just as had been prophesied, and all that was left of her was her skull, the palms of her hand, and her feet. Let me show that you the significance of this. Her skull, she thought only evil. Her feet were swift to running into running to mischief, and the palms of her hands, as she did only evil, she shed innocent blood. Listen to what Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says. Six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart or mind that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Sisters, remember that your body is a temple. So what do you fill your temple with so that you'll be fit? How can you be sure that you're fit so that you will think right do right, walk right, and stay on the way of holiness. How do you do as Peter says in 2 Peter 1 and 10, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. 
What do you do to be fit for this life and in the life and the life to come? How do you make your calling and election sure? What do you do? Second Peter five, Second uh, Peter one five through eight. He says, and besides all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness or sisterly kindness, and to sisterly kindness charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound or overflow, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these things be in your temple and overflow, you won't be barren or you won't be unfruitful, but, but you'll be fit for this life and for the life to come. And then verse eight says, if these things be in you, and verse 10 says, not only should these things be in you, but you should do these things. For if you do these things, you'll never fall. To do the things that are in you. Peter is saying the same thing that Paul said, what God is putting in, now you begin to do, you begin to work out spiritually saved by grace, mentally to be transformed in your renewed mind, physically to do behavior based on your renewed mind. You're fit for this life and the life to come. First Timothy 4, 8 says, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that is that now is and of that life to come. Wherefore, sisters, if these things be in you and abound, if you do, if you add these things to your life and do them in your behavior, then you'll be fit for this life, but you have the promise of the life to come. Look at the promise after you have done these things. Second Peter 1 and, 1 and 11 says, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sisters, our Lord will roll out the red carpet to welcome you home. You're his ambassador. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. You know, when the president of the United States appoints an ambassador to, and he sends him or her to a foreign land, the ambassador is on an assignment. He is a representative of the country that sent him on the assignment. He's the ambassador from the United States. And that's how he is addressed, Mr. or Miss Ambassador, the ambassador from the United States. He is not known by his own given name. He is known by the country he represents. He's the ambassador. He is known by the country that he represents. He is on assignment from his country to represent his country and to represent his leader. He, she, or he, he or she does not speak of himself, but he lifts up the country and his leader. He is on assignment for just a little while and he has a job to do, to tell those in the country to which he is assigned about his country. He represents not himself, but the one who sent him. This place is not his home. He's just there for a little while. And when the assignment is ended and the ambassador has completed his assignment and done a good job, the president calls him home. He sends Air Force One to pick him up. And when he lands in Washington, D.C., the host is ready to receive him. The door of the plane opens. The military rolls out the red carpet. The president is waiting to welcome Mr. or Miss Ambassador home. He steps out of the door of the plane and begins to come down the stairs. The band begins to play. The flags are waving and the president welcomes Mr. Ambassador home. Well done, Mr. Ambassador. You represented your country well. Welcome home. Job well done. Well, sister ambassadors, you're on an assignment from the kingdom of God and your title is Madam Christian. When you obey the gospel, you're known as Christian and you represent the Christ whom you serve. You don't lift yourself up. You lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me, not to you, unto him. You're on assignment for just a little while in this earthly realm. This world is not your home. You just pass and through. One day the Lord himself will call you from labor to reward. He won't roll off the red carpet. He'll roll off those streets of gold and he'll charge his angels to give you an abundant welcome into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You'll be welcomed by that great cloud of witnesses that the Hebrew writer speaks of in Hebrews 12. All your family and loved ones who have gone on waiting to welcome you home. The Lord himself shall welcome you to receive you to himself. Well done, good and faithful ambassador. You've been faithful. You made yourself fit spiritually, emotionally, physically, and you represented me well. Enter into the joy of your master. Welcome home. God bless you, sister. That, that, that sister is on fire. <laughs> 
Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. She always gives us such an amazing lesson. Oh, Tiffany. I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> you already in it. Go to face it. Let this be you. Go ahead. Do what you want. Go do. ahead, Tiffany. I forgot. I forgot. Nope. You already good. There's nothing else left to say, Ross. You got it. <laughs> she has done an amazing job. I don't have to say anything else. Everybody is already going through the chat and is excited about everything. As soon as you started talking about ambassadors, I already knew, Dr. Dye, you was about to catch fire. It was already done, and you did it. I knew it was coming. I said, oh, the switch is coming. Here she goes. And then she went into turbo mode, and she said, here you go. It's up to you. Glory. So <laughs> thank you, Dr. Dye. Such an awesome lesson. I know that everybody is enjoying this. What an amazing, amazing word. To you, Roxy, go ahead. Now, I'm, I want to say this real quick before. Sister Joyce, you send me that, text me that login link for service, and um, let's put it in the chat. I want to speak to that this afternoon. I mean, at the end of class, and I don't want to forget. Text it to me and put it in the chat. I'm sorry, Tiffany. That's all I need to say because I need it. So, Sister Joyce, be focused. I need to tell her on the screen. <laughs> all right. Okay. No so, problem. All right, sisters. Uh, so we have a few minutes. So we'll be uh, getting us ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll be going into your breakouts in just a moment. Excuse okay. me. May I get the uh, have the uh, scriptures uh, email or text to me, please? Is that possible? Uh, yes, and you can also just go on to online if you'd like and get them off of our website. Um, Actually, I'll do that. Thank you. I forgot yes. about that. Yes. I Thank you. That's okay. This is Clarissa from uh, uh, Sister Wisconsin. Clarissa. What what class are you? What what class do you uh, go to? Fifty nine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sister Delpha Griffin, what class do you go to? All right. What about my, uh, T uh, Tawana Taylor? Where do you go? Uh, yes. Hi, Delpha Griffin. Uh, I go to Farmington Hills Church of Christ. No, I mean, what, what class do you go to right now? What age? What age? Oh, I don't know. This is my first time. Okay. Just tell me your age real quick and I'll, I'll send you to 65. your class. Gotcha. Okay, um, Teresa, to... I'm sorry, Tawana Taylor, go ahead. Where are you go? Uh, Sister Wendis. Okay, got you. Teresa Clark, where do you go? Sister Die. Me... All right, got you. Uh, uh, you go to Die Menzon. Where'd you, how'd you end up out of Renee's? There you go. Patricia Ruffin, you're in, are you in Wendis or Renee's? Okay, what about Camille? I was in Makita. Oh wow. Okay, let me move you to. They told me to leave. They they kicked <laughs> you out, Mama. Okay, yeah. here you go. I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. Um. Uh. What about iPad? It just says iPad. Renee. Camille, Camille make me the host oh, real quick. Okay, I do it. Got you. And then uh, Galaxy. You, you hear me? Okay. Where's the host? Okay. Camille, make me the host so you can go to your okay. class. Uh, where are you? All right, everybody, unmute so I can get you real quick. As soon as Camille makes me the host, I can make that transition. All right. Um, 864-784-2644. Where are you going? Windows class. How you doing, lady? All right, Latoya, where you go? Are you summer, springtime, or summertime? Um, I'm a Tiffany's group. Latoya, why your name is? Oh yeah, hey Latoya, your name is not on the. What are you? How do you call it on a number? No, I'm calling on Zoom. I know, but what kind of? I don't know. I don't see. Oh, you gone? No, I'm here. I'm trying to see why you, well, maybe you're in the wrong group or something. Are you having joined Latoya? Where are you? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, you know what? She put you, I'm gonna move you to Tiffany. They put you in the wrong group, uh, Tiffany. Yeah. How you go? Okay, you should be going in a second. Galaxy S, S20 FE 5G. 
Just unmute yourselves and talk to me. There's a bridge background. Who has a bridge um, background? Hey, sister. Uh, okay, sister. This is, Jeanette, this is Jeanette Henderson with the bridge background. Okay, Jeanette, where, um, what group, how yes. old are you? I'm 65, I mean, 68. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna put you where you need to go. Well, you, Sister Renee. All right. Hey, Sister um, Tanya Jones, where are you? Where are you going? Uh, 55. 55, okay. Yes, uh-huh. She goes, Sister, we'll go with that. 